Hi, everybody. I uh, just want to welcome you all to uh, the first of a series of seminars that uh, BCTF will be doing on professional issues. And we're, we're making it available t uh, to a wider audience today through our live stream. And we're also going to be publishing a report of the uh, key information from the seminars that uh, we're going to be conducting. Uh, this seminar is a report from uh, curriculum committee members for two subjects, science and social studies. And uh, we'll be having another seminar also about the uh, arts curriculum. And uh, it's my pleasure today to introduce uh, two of our uh, presenters who represent the social studies and uh, science uh, PSA of the BCTF and who are also part of the uh, social and science curriculum um, uh, revision that we have. So we have on my left uh, Dale uh, Martelli. Welcome, Dale. And Dale is, like I said, a social studies curriculum team member. He's also president of our social studies uh, PSA, and he's uh, also currently uh, social studies department head and Flex Humanity District Program Coordinator at the Vancouver Technical Secondary School. He's currently pursuing a PhD at SFU in the philosophy of history education and bridging conflict narratives. Welcome, Dale. And on my right, we have uh, Nancy McAleer. And Nancy is uh, part of the uh, Science uh, Teachers PSA, and she's also part of the Science Curriculum Revision Team. And she's a member of the Quality Teaching and Learning Project and part of the Sook School District's team to develop critical thinking competencies in the new curriculum. And her current, current area of professional interest is in assessment and evaluation of student inquiry and teacher mentorship in blended learning environments. Nancy uses the smarter science method of teaching student inquiry developed by the Thames Valley School District in Ontario. Uh, welcome, Thank Nancy. You. Uh, we appreciate uh, that the ministry uh, has been open to this collaboration on uh, curriculum development and uh, that we have uh, many uh, members of the BCTF who are on these uh, curriculum uh, revision committees. And uh, it's also important uh, to note, though, to remember that this is a ministry process, this curriculum revision, and the views and contributions of our community members are not necessarily what will come out of the reports from the ministry in its finality. The curriculum committee members cannot be held to account for the content or format if they disagree with the ministry reports. And today we're going to be focusing on three questions in particular, which we'll, I'll run through right now. The first question will be, what is the positive that has come out of the committee and the processes? Two, what concerns do you have about the direction and what is not there as well as what is there? And number three, what should teachers and the BCTF do to work toward a positive result from the curriculum process in your area? And after uh, Dale and Mart uh, Nancy have uh, presented their views. We'll have some time for questions and there's some uh, participants here in the room with us at the BCTF who will be asking questions and those of you who are out there right now uh, viewing this on live stream can also uh, ask some questions and you can send them by email to seminar at bctf.ca and these questions will be read for our panel for their responses. So again, questions to seminar at bctf.ca. So we're going to begin, and uh, with the first question, uh, we're going to start with uh, Dale. So Dale, what is the positive that has come out of the committee and the process, in your opinion? Oh, thanks, Jim. Uh, we're actually, I was going to have Nancy. Oh. Oh, Nancy's going to start on this one? Okay. So this is, yeah, because we're going to try to do it conversationally that we're back and forth with each other. So, Great. Okay. Nancy. Well, first off, thanks for um, having us here. And I just wanted to share initially how positive the process was for me as a teacher. It probably was the most impactful professional development I've ever had. And it was really exciting to be involved at the uh, committee meetings where essentially the teachers were asked please help us develop this curriculum it's going to be what you want it to be and that was really empowering both for us as teachers but also for our students and it was really really exciting now one thing that's actually a little bit frustrating about the curriculum the way it's posted is there's some things missing certainly from the science curriculum there's another layer to those curriculum documents that hasn't actually been added online yet 
which we called eval or pardon me, elaborations when we were developing them. And that includes a lot more details about the content. And I've been online to the BCTF forums and seen some of the, the critical questions that people have posed. And thankfully they have, because we shouldn't just take everything carte blanche and accept that what we are given is perfect. We should be asking critical questions so that we can do the best work possible for our students. But one of the questions, for example, that was uh, brought up, people were concerned about where climate change was in the curriculum because it wasn't directly apparent from what was posted online. And if you had a chance to view the elaborations, which you probably haven't yet because they aren't posted online yet, um, you'll, you would find them in the grade nine cycling of matter unit where we look at carbon and nitrogen cycles, for example. And then you can see students are going to explain how carbon moves through the Earth's system, including the geosphere, for example, how it might benefit by improving soils for agriculture or might harm society and the environment, and how human activities can affect the environment, for example, coral reef destruction, air pollution, and look at the interactions of those Earth systems. So although some of those finer points aren't there, and it's confusing for teachers because the elaborations aren't there yet, there has been planning done for how deep one would go in these different areas. And that is a big area of concern because it's a little vague. In some ways it's good that it's vague because teachers have autonomy. They have the opportunity to develop approaches that suit the needs of their own students. But at the same time, it's also a little bit scary because it's not as prescribed. So you don't have the list of achievement indicators that we used to have, but we have more freedom to make a curriculum that's more engaging, that's more place-based, that respects Aboriginal knowledge in a way that the previous curriculum could not. And with science in particular, it's really exciting because what we're looking at is an evidence-based curriculum that has a solid foundation of conceptual knowledge where students hopefully can develop a lifelong interest, they can develop the habits of mind, the curiosity, the sense of wonder, the skepticism, but also the values that would help make them responsible citizens in terms of their ethics and their environmental approaches as well. So I was very excited by that. And in terms of what's really positive about the process, I really liked that it was open for teacher involvement. And when we were talking about this earlier, the fact that it's kind of homegrown, the teachers are the ones generating the curriculum and looking at what is developmentally appropriate for our students instead of a top-down approach where the ministry is saying this is what you do A, B, C, D, we're actually taking it from the grassroots and offering that to the teachers in the province which I thought was really exciting and the fact that it's not locked in stone that it can be edited as needed. But I'm not sure about the science but one of the uh, unique things before I begin mine was, was, was uh, ours it was a representational factor mm -hmm. and in both summers that this was worked on there's teachers from across the province mm -hmm. and meaning from urban rural schools from uh, K to 12 school in the north to an urban school and what came out in some of the meetings was just incredible diversity of needs uh, uh, desires of what to be taught in the classroom and particularly for social studies, this idea that perhaps there isn't a single social studies curriculum that's going to fit the needs of everyone in the province to come up with something that is malleable for wherever you might be teaching. And I thought that not just the fact that it was a teacher-based curriculum, but it's a curriculum designed by teachers that represent an incredibly rich um, variety of, uh, of, of experiential kind of classroom um, nodes, in a sense, to, to bring to the development. Mm -hmm. And if you're looking at place-based learning, there's perhaps you shouldn't even want to have a common curriculum for the whole province because where they are, you know, as we were, when we were discussing earlier, you were talking about how it had to be relevant to the student first and then to their community. Why and is then, a student for St. John yeah. learning about an intersection in East Vancouver? It doesn't make yeah. any sense. And if we, we want to have a program that actually meets the needs of the students, it's a lot more valuable to that student to learn, obviously, about their own community. And one thing that I really liked, too, about the new curriculum was the room for student inquiry, for example, in science, which I was obviously more involved with, that allows time for students to have a sense of direction in their own learning. They, there's more student empowerment in the classroom because, for example, students might be designing their own experiments. And what I have found f through my own practice is that leads to a higher level of student engagement. And when you have a higher level of engagement, you have a higher level of achievement. 
a deeper understanding and they develop independence in their learning, which is very exciting. I have a question yeah. um, that's been emailed in, Janice Needham staff. Um, does the new curriculum allow for a differentiation for gifted students and gifted students with learning disabilities? Does it provide the tools and materials needed for teachers to meet the needs of those students? So we're talking about differentiation. If we're trying for that question, though, the difficulty is the first part. Um, just looking at the surface curriculum, the answer would be yes. I mean, in the sense that the opening is there, and the, at the, the risk, of what Nancy was referring to in terms of that feeling, I don't, the experience I had at a doctoral course at SFU of having a blank syllabus in front of me and that freezing, that is a, it's something that's created by us as students. It, it actually, the experience of having that was interesting. But the materials and tools, that's the problem. That would be, that's going to be speaking to question mm -hmm. number two because that's one of the issues I had was the fact that it, the uh, curriculum was rolled out by the ministry in part, just the surface venue, the, I guess, uh, Nancy, what did you, oh, the table of contents. Mm -hmm. so we had the table of contents coming out without any idea of what the contents actually looked like in, in a substantial form. And I think we'll speak to that more mm -hmm. when we get to question number two. I okay. think, if I could address that a little bit, I think when we get into the, um, critical thinking competencies, for example, right. when those right. get shared, we're going to see some concrete examples of how students are able to express their knowledge in different ways and students at different levels with different strengths. And the, have, the fact that those cross-curricular competencies do thread through all subjects allows for, um, for lack of a better term, multiple intelligences or people to express um, their ability to differentiate their own learning. What I do with myself, as an example with inquiry, is if I ask my students to develop an experiment and I assist them with their experimental design, get them to the point where they can do it independently, the students who are ready to take on more will want to take on more. And they will make a more complicated experiment, their analysis will be more complicated, their next steps that they would like to take on will be more complicated. And they will just do that because they become emotionally invested in their work in a way that they wouldn't with a worksheet. For students who are uh, struggling, just the fact that they can have that sense of direction is a, is a big deal for them and it makes it a lot more engaging. And in terms of meeting the needs of students with, say, a learning disability who may be gifted, it depends on how obviously they um, struggle with their learning, but who, for example, says that you have to do a lab report in grade seven. Well, maybe you can express your knowledge through video. Maybe you can do it through alternate projects. By opening up the curriculum and saying, show what you know, you can differentiate it or help the students differentiate for themselves how they express their Nancy, knowledge. Nancy, you referenced the competencies and the Ministry of Education has given us an update that they may go live this week or early next week. They're just in the final few ed edits, web edits. So hopefully we'll see the early competency posted shortly. And, and Nancy, uh, before we go on to the next question, and, and, and possibly Dale could uh, elaborate on it too, you've used the term uh, place-based learning. Yes. You just want to elaborate on that? Well, in the science context, place-based learning is learning about the place where you live. So if you were learning about agriculture and you lived in the lower mainland, you might learn about the agriculture of Delta. But if you were living in Fort St. John, it would be specific to your area or learning about the culture of the farmers in your area as opposed to just learning about BC as a whole. Right. Uh, bringing in elders from the community, for example, to come and talk about traditional knowledge from that specific location. Whatever's related to where the children actually are to help them understand the environment in which they live first before we start trying to apply it in a broader context. Right. And, and do you want to add to that, Dale? Yeah, in, in a sense, can I in, respond to the positives on, for the, for the first question? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, you can, uh, we're, we're still I'm within that. Sure Na Nancy, is that we're, okay? Nancy? We're yes. still within okay. the first question, yeah. Okay, I'm gonna um, echo what Nancy referred to as the teacher base, and then, like I said, I added to the actual representational nature of the teachers that were on those teams. Uh, fundamentally, this has probably been the, the single most significant overhaul of social studies, at least in my lifetime. Uh, grade seven curriculum in 1969 was not 
very different from what it was from what it is this year. Um, so not only was content realigned in some respects to to match other jurisdictions within Canada, but it was we looked at progressive curriculums from that were being put in place in New Zealand and Australia and Sweden. And with the influence of, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Peter Satius's work and Roland Case's work is the most fundamental positive for me was placing student or inquiry on the nature of methodological thinking up front as the drivers of the curriculum and not just have it. And I don't actually mean to do disservice to Jack Granistee, and he's a great historian, but that tendency to look at history as the single grand narrative of history and not looking at the possibility that the people may have more than one understanding of social, social uh, um, events. And that, I'm not just speaking with historically, I'm talking geographically, politically, legal and economic. It was a curricular opening for us because we were given a blank slate saying, here's what we've had. And I think at one point the ministry official took the old curriculum blowing up and started walking with it and walked right out of the room, went into another room, and it was all a checklist approach to teaching. And then we just chucked it and began anew and had looking from what we saw as teachers of what needed to be in the classroom. And the driver with it all was we wanted autonomy. We wanted to be able to design. We wanted to be able to create with our students in mind, our communities in mind. And I think this is speaking with the play space thing. There's the idea that there's this classroom community situational praxis, this idea that we create a social studies curriculum that will meet um, the relevant needs of our community within a globalized context. The other, um, that's the other aspect of it. Because we looked at curriculums in New Zealand, it was fascinating the way they were able to put Maori and, and New Zealand uh, European cultural studies in a global context. So it was no longer treating New Zealand as some sort of separate, I mean it is an island, but having it treated like as a geographical, historical separate entity and having nothing, no interrelationships with anywhere globally. As we've seemingly done with Canada, we've, uh, with the curriculum we've never spiraled it. We've always had it this kind of a hodgepodge of little separate areas where grade nine split in half and there's Canada and there's Europe. And, lo and there doesn't seem to be any flow or integration between the idea that Canada was actually part of a greater historically geographical sort of situational practice. So that was built into it. It's, Nancy and I talked about the, the curriculum's not locked in, it's edited, it's free, it's something that can change, not just situationally, but it can change provincially. The other aspect was working on cross-subject integration, building a curriculum that we, that science and social studies can look at ways to cross curricular, particularly important for elementary, but I also think that the possibility there for secondary, I work in a program that integrates all the time. So what I'm fascinated by is the avenues, the openings for looking across, across the uh, departments and saying how can we um, integrate what we're doing as teachers. Um, and I think well, this is answering, to kind of going to number two, but just the one positive about the curriculum, I don't think is, has been seen or has been pushed or explained as much. It is an opening for any teacher to do with what they feel their strength is. So if you're, you, you just have a passion for anthropology, then that's your focus. There's nothing saying you have to, it is not a history curriculum. It is a inquiry-based curriculum akin to some kind of social studies methodology. My concern is we're not sure what that means, and I mean, even in, within as a student of history, we're still debating what it means to do historical methodology. There isn't a real clear understanding of that. Um, and there's only one, two more things I want to be say about positive was the fact that we infused the curriculum with First Nations Aboriginal history, and going back to this idea of looking at inquiry, is thinking about we need to think about deeper. I don't. I think we did some of it during the process, and I think there's still avenues to do more of it. We have the inquiry as the drivers. We have suggested content in the table of contents. We don't see the elaborations yet. But what we need to look at is a deeper question of what we're doing and why we're doing it and what does it mean to do interpretation, particularly within so social, uh, social sciences. Science has a clear path to follow. I mean, empirical study of, of, I think, the scientific methods laid out it's clearly philosophically justified. There might be some disputes between some philosophers of science, but it, it's generally kind of a clear path. But with respect to so social sciences, in particular history and, and human geography, we just do things without actually thinking about why we're doing it or how we're doing it. 
And I think there's a question of how that's implied for teachers and students to ask to go probe even deeper, is that how are we approaching historical events? Why I'm emphasizing this is because one of the things that have been left out a lot of curriculums is oral history. And I'm not necessarily just the orality of Aboriginal stories, but orality exists in all cultures. So if we can build a socialized curriculum that has the opening for orality and treating it not just, a document fixates orality in a sense. It is just a fixed moment of orality. But with the, with the new treatment or a new philosophy that's of, edu of history education that's coming, that's arising through the work of Philip Gardner, um, uh, Paul Ricoeur, is this idea that you can actually, oral history is just as empirically valid to study as any document that's placed in front of you. So that, to me, is the sum of the positives in terms of developing the new curriculum for social science. And just to follow up a little bit on what you're saying there, is in science particularly, there's always going to be new discoveries that are happening, and good teachers will always bring in you know, a, a clip from uh, YouTube or a newspaper article or something to spur the imagination of their students about those topics as things change. Science is provisional, and our understanding of the world changes as new discoveries are made, but it doesn't just apply to science. All of our subjects will evolve over time, and having a curriculum where the ministry, at least at the moment, seems open to letting that curriculum evolve, letting it change, and having a live document that can be edited as needed, as opposed to a book that somebody published 15 years ago and they say that's the curriculum and once the book is published you're stuck with it, I think is a fantastic um, evolution in terms of their willingness to actually let us have input. Before we go on to question two, there's just one other question that's housed in number one. Can you tell us who comprised the teams, who made up the teams that worked on the curriculum? Um, in the science team, we had representatives from all over the province. Uh, most people there were public school teachers. There were, um, there was one uh, retired teacher. There was one person who taught and was an administrator part-time. There was also a, uh, a representative from a private institution. There was a um, curriculum specialist from the Ministry of Education, as well as a curriculum speci pardon me, specialist who was um, recommended by the BCTF and uh, contracted to the Ministry of Education. Not yeah. unsimilar, I guess. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, there was, um, for the most part, it was well represented of K to 12. And that some of the difficulties in when this document came out was, uh, I hope people understand that this, it has to reflect, you know, at kindergarten, grade four, grade 11, teacher. I mean, it's, it's something that has to be uh, fit for all in that way. And then the other aspect, too, was that the regional representation was very rich in both teams. In the first mm -hmm. summer, um, Peter Satius was uh, part of our team, so we had an academic. In the second team's experience, um, it was just teachers. I believe there was also a... Some a, private school teachers. Yeah. Yeah. I believe there was also an Aboriginal representative on each yeah. committee as well. Yeah, there was. In fact, for the first go at this, it was uh, it, it, Ken Lee, an Aboriginal teacher, was um, mm -hmm. uh, instrumental in trying to in putting it all together and seeing the sort of the big picture of how it could be all transformed and fitted together with uh, both Peter and Roland, Roland Case's work. And uh, listening to uh, your responses to question one, one of the things that has come out uh, for me in terms of what I'm hearing with the, the the new curriculum and where it's going and the potential of it is just the enabling of the flourishing of our creative creativity of our teachers in uh, in this work and, and infusing it into uh, into their classrooms as long as well as uh, bringing out the creativity of our students in terms of the nature and, and how deep that uh, mm -hmm. teachers can go into the various aspects of in these areas so I think that's that's going to be a positive uh, and I would piece add, as we move forward. I would add a respect for the creativity of yes. our teachers. We're being given space to take our students in the direction we see most fit, yeah. and that is a welcome change. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> we look forward to that for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, we go to question two. So uh, uh, do you have any uh, concerns right now about uh, the direction that... Uh, uh, the revisions may be taking and uh, you know what's uh, there that you see is uh, there right now and what are some thing, uh, the things that you think are missing mm -hmm. in terms of, 
of what's happening right now in the revisions. I think Nancy and I probably shared some common concerns. One of our first concerns had to be with uh, the question about implementation. I mean, it's just, it's been left into a, to unanswered, it's an unanswered question. I mean, particularly with social studies, given that it's a fairly radical content transformation. I don't know how they're gonna do social 11. Like, how do they disappear that in a way, if that in fact is the way they were going? Pitching it without the grad review seemed kind of strange to me because whatever they're doing with the grad review, whatever they're doing with assessment could knock the wind out of anything that was done within the K to nine. I mean, it could just pull a rug, whatever other metaphors I can somehow remember, but underneath of it. And I, that implementation, Nancy, you spoke too about that, your concerns about that. And Absolutely, I think obviously teachers are invested in what they do. They're invested in the curriculum that they're currently offering to their students. And when you see it potentially being replaced by something that looks like a skeleton, it doesn't actually have elaborations, it doesn't have the, there's a mention of the um, cross-curricular competencies, but you don't see them. And people are thinking, what is this? How could there, there's nothing there. How can I work with this? And what I think people need to understand is in, in previous years when we've had a curriculum delivered, we've seen the finished product. We didn't see it along the way while it was being developed. And right now we are actually seeing the process. And everybody's getting to look at the process and offer feedback, which is wonderful. But we don't see the finished product yet because we're not there. It's very much in development. And I think there should have been more. I, uh, my concern is that, I, I mean, as expressed to PSAC through our meetings with this, um, the uh, PSA Association, the PSAs, as well as to the ministry, is that you're giving a document. It's great to see the process. It's great to see the feedback. The feedback to what? Your feedback, you're, you're, you're responding to a table of contents. You don't have, the, what we had that's missing is the click-throughs. This whole thing is entirely not supposed to be in paper. And it, the intent is that it's all um, electronic. So you're both, you're, you're, uh, there's supposed to be an enabling feature, and I'm sort of computerly, computer illiterate, so excuse me, but there's things that you can click through, like science has it bolded, that you can see what mm -hmm. elaborations look like. Like, what does it mean to take this inquiry, apply it to this content, what is that actually gonna look like? Mm -hmm. And for a lot of teachers, it's like, <laughs> I mean, I get this, and I, it looks great and stuff, but how am I supposed to do it? And that was our other, mm -hmm. other concern with lack of a little bit of click through, is the resources. Great, so what do we do with all the tech? What do I do with the $30,000 I spent on counterpoints? Like, what do I do with all those textbooks? How am I gonna manage the resources? Where are all these other resources to develop? And uh, how many hours am I gonna have to spend on the internet trying to dig up um, documents? Mm -hmm. Or, and I, Nancy, you were speaking about buying, like even going, how much money we're gonna to have to spend. Well, if we, yeah, if we go to project-based learning, if we do a lot of inquiry activities that are really hands-on, really cool stuff to do, how many consumable items do you have to buy in order to have your students experience that? And who's paying for that? Where is that money gonna come from? You know, are we going to see additional funding for the adoption of this curriculum? Are we going to see any money for in-service or other supports? Where, where is that funding gonna come from for this implementation? And that's a huge concern when you start looking at how much resources cost, as you say, you know, how many thousand dollars in textbooks. They're not useless now because... They're still, they're still yeah. a resource. Absolutely, they can still be used. But if we used to do, let's say, asexual reproduction in grade nine, and now we're doing it in grade eight, let's say, well then those resources would have to be moved perhaps to a different school, depending on how the structure of the district is. If it gets moved more than one grade, then you have issues with students reading level can they actually understand the resources that were previously used and some of it maybe are, are some of it is have to be carefully phrased because sometimes i think we're reacting to that our kids can't handle that and it's, it's kind of odd sometimes because i think well social you know social element concepts shouldn't be taught to 15 and 16 year olds whereas every other canadian 15 and 16 year old are actually learning the similar content without without much problem but it's the funding that's the problem and it is related also to the implementation if the ministry does not provide the funding necessary to do this slowly and gradually, if it's just a piece of paper that's put in front of me in September, most of us are gonna look at that piece of paper and say, fine, I'm going back to the way I've done it ever before, and change is simply not gonna be an aspect of it. And we're not going to actually affect real authentic change in our practices unless it's given the support, the PD, the funding, the money. 
And I, I know with the, what we're doing with the BCTF with the Learning Hub is an awesome way to start. I mean, I attempted it. We attempted it with the BCSSTA uh, doing a Ning site for resource development. It's just not enough. There needs to be a singular place that a teacher can go to with ease of access, mm -hmm. quick, navigable, like you know, whatever that means, na you know, to navigate through it and you can get the resources you need at a you know, click of a button. You say, I want, and it, I mean, probably a model could be like Roland cases is for social studies. The model could be something similar to what Roland has developed with case studies. You know, just being able to pull that case study and say, mm -hmm. aha, I got a case study for World War I. This looks great. Yank it down, pull it, and it fits, and I can, you know, shape it and morph it to what I want to fit. PD is another thing, they were like Nancy and I were speaking about. It, it's, not, it's not enough just to give us a piece of paper. It, this is a complete um, overhaul of everything that we do as teachers. It needs to be, mini it's ministry, in my mind, it's the ministry's responsibility to provide the necessary professional development to make sure that this actually gets thoughtfully processed. And professional development not provided for, and I, and I know this might seem, not, I'm not trying to be contradictory, but not provided for, paid for by the ministry, but provided for by teachers, if that makes sense, that it's teacher-guided uh, um, change. Mm -hmm. And I, the other concerns that we, if I could speak to the specific concerns that, that social studies have had, is that we've had a real debate about the grand narrative. I mean, this speaks a little bit to Harper and things that have occurred in the past, but um, where is the common narrative? There's discussions about, oh my God, we're not gonna teach Vimy Ridge. Well, maybe not, and, but maybe there are questions about the role of those events in, in narrative, and is there a single narrative? And these are the kinds of questions that we need to hash out as teachers provincially. Um, for, for example, in Social Studies 11, it speaks about the rise of media in the 20s and the formation of the Canadian identity and I was having this discussion with my students and I said, for whom? And they stopped and said, what do you mean for whom? I said, for whom was this supposed Canadian identity being formed to the media? It wasn't for the Aboriginals and it wasn't for immigrant Italians because immigrant Italians didn't understand the English in the media and it certainly wasn't for Quebecois. So maybe there's more multiple ways in which to understand how um, it rolls out. But it's a debate that's gonna occur amongst teachers because teachers, we as a, group has sometimes been fixed on this idea that there is such a thing as the Canadian narrative, that there is something that we want kids to come up with, that everybody needs to know 1867. But the more important question is, what do we need to know about 1867 as, as opposed to memorizing that date? And the last thing, I guess, and I'm not sure if it affects science, would be the institutional resource sharing. The, I think that one of the, um, I mean, I'm thinking particularly in Vancouver, I mean, grade eight content has now been moved down into grade seven. So as a department head at Van Tech, my biggest challenge will be taking everything that I have for that grade eight content and then trying to offer it up to my satellite elementaries or my whatever the term is, my feeder schools, and being able to provide that because I'm no longer gonna need it in the class. So, and at the middle school level, it's gonna be the five, six transition and the eight, nine transition, like where those resources are gonna be problematic and trying to move, actually move en masse large amounts of resources. And I just, that's just a concern I have um, institutionally. In science, it's a little bit more complicated because we didn't uh, do it as systematically as social studies did compared to the current curriculum where you basically were moving some content down. Where science topics got reassigned was not always necessarily to the previous grade. So that would be more of a problem probably with science than with social studies. But I think one of the other issues I'd like to touch on um, is the perception of a possible lack of rigor because there are fewer uh, topics to cover. And if people don't know how they would implement inquiry, for example, they might perceive that as a watering down of the curriculum. And what I would like to see is that people who are involved, either community members or teachers, students, we get to the point where we understand that fewer outcomes does not necessarily mean less learning, that we go deeper. Instead of being a mile wide and an inch deep, we go narrower focus, much deeper learning experience, much more profound. And in order for that to happen, some teachers are going to need that extra support we were talking about. Um, we don't have that checklist of outcomes in this curriculum. We don't have those achievement indicators where it says students can demonstrate their knowledge by doing A, B, C, D, E. Here's the vocabulary that they can use while they're doing it. We don't have that anymore. So 
for example, I think the primary teachers are way ahead of the secondary teachers on this. They have experiential learning all the time and they respond to the needs of the students in ways that secondary teachers can only dream of. Uh, but science teachers in particular, from my own perspective, I know are going to need support in implementing student inquiry methods in their classrooms. How to teach experimental design, for example. How to teach in such a way that you can actually differentiate automatically and not just see your um, more academically adept students being successful, but actually see your struggling students, your mid-range students really understand what a fair test is, how to set themselves up for success in that way. But if we don't provide in-service, that's not going to happen. That's not something that people who teach secondary school, for example, are accustomed to doing. It's something that they're going to need support with. Another issue that's come up as an, uh, a concern about content was the reduction in mathematical approaches and equations in the science curriculum. And this was done in order to give the teachers more space to teach the math concepts when they were appropriate, both for the class's needs and also the material that was covered. But more time could be spent on just actually understanding the concepts involved as opposed to just crunching numbers. And what we find is a lot of kids le get left behind when we start putting a lot of equations in to their science class. What are they really going to need to learn? A concept, not necessarily how to crunch numbers. They, they need to understand, for example, the concept of velocity. They need to understand momentum. They need to understand relative velocity. So if I'm driving down the road this way and another car is coming at me, how fast is he going? How fast am I going? Am I going to hit him? You know, understanding those kind of concepts, for example, just to boil it down to really simple um, explanation of it. If we, if we concentrate so much on the actual calculations, we're just going to leave kids behind. If you concentrate on, instead, the concepts, and then when your students are ready, start putting in formulas, start putting in equations, then you're really going to have a deeper understanding for the people that are ready for that math. And for the ones that aren't, they weren't ready now. Having those calculations in there isn't helping them now. By changing the curriculum, maybe they'll actually understand the concepts better. Well, one other thing on process, too, I mean, we've got to be careful of the language here. This language has gone through more than one edit, and some mm -hmm. of the edits have nothing to do with the teachers involved. Like I see here, uh, students will develop competency to be active, informed citizens. And if I had my druthers, that word citizens would never have occurred there. It would have been more individuals. And my understanding of concepts of content, I mean, I, when I was writing uh, contract language for uh, VESTA way back in the 80s and early 90s, using the word will was a fairly strong command term. Um, we had more that students may know under and understand some of the following concepts. So in some ways, um, as a bit of an anarchist, I would step back from this and say, okay, that's fine. That's the language of the ministry contract. And I have a concern with it, but I'm not going to buy into it. I'm not, I'm, it still allows for my autonomy to say, no, I'm going to do it differently and I'm going to look at it in a different way. So there's a number of questions that have come in on number two. One of them is, is there enough meat and potatoes for beginning teachers who may not have a strong background in one particular area? Well, I think that's where mentorship has to come in. Uh, but I, from my experience talking to newer teachers and talking to more experienced teachers, a lot of the people who are struggling are not the newer teachers. Mm -hmm. A lot of them are the more experienced teachers. And so, again, it boils down to in-service, mm -hmm. offering training if necessary for people. You spoke to that, Denise, and I, I was giving workshops at SFU and discovered that the teachers within PDP have, they, they were the least resistant, they were the more aware, they, oh, that sounds, that's what we're doing. And I thought you were mentioned earlier today about the, the new teachers conference. Yeah. Yeah, that they were quite aware of, of 21st century learning and they felt that wasn't an issue they had God, to get their I hate head. That term, I know, but that was <laughs> that was their term. <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, there's one here about if there are no prescribed learning outcomes or materials, will planning lessons be more difficult? Well, there are concepts and content that are on the curriculum documents, and again, they're not published yet, but the elaborations will be there. Mm -hmm. So, I wouldn't say that there's. I think there's more guidance than people are seeing at the moment. And 
again, it's understandable. There isn't there there isn't that much there on the website. So when people look at it, they thought, well, where's my course gone? But there will be more coming. I would be um, except. You know, go ahead. Sorry, Nan, except that if you're designing your lessons mm -hmm. with from the like this is the big 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 fight because they tried to flip this at one point in the process is having the inquiry skills in that first call. You got to basically it was just a physical spatial way of beginning it. We wanted it in that first column because that's where you begin. So the design begins with the inquiry. So if you're asking students to sort of understand the nature of significance, whether it be political significance, geographical significance, historical think with social studies, I would, is it gonna be more challenging? Yes. Is it gonna be more difficult right now? Absolutely, because of the nature of the resources. Um, can it be fun? Absolutely. I mean, you can look at that inquiry and say, okay, I wanna talk about significance, let's do Vimy Ridge, but let's talk about the multiple ways we can understand Vimy Ridge and have some fun with it and use some different varieties of interpretation. Causes of World War One for what was Social 11, what is Social 10 now, oh, presumably, depending on what happens. I mean, those kinds of things. So I think that res my response would be it's gonna be more challenging and difficult. It can be made easier if we have the resources. And if we think in terms of not building our classroom around content, we're building our class, it really is the most important thing. And everybody talks about this. Oakshop talked about this in the 70s. What does it mean to be an educated, uh, not Oakshop, some other English type. Anyways, talked about what was the nature of being an educated individual. I mean, we're not looking at somebody who can come out and play Trivial Pursuit. I mean, that's for Google people now. I mean, what, you know, the idea is we want critically, I like critically active informed individuals. And if that's our guiding post, then I think that that kind of negotiation, meaning you can negotiate with students and communities, does make the process of designing lessons challenging and difficult, but it can be incredibly rich and positive in the way of doing it. Also, they uh, do have a tab at the bottom of the ministry website that says instructional examples. Yeah. There's nothing in it yet. <laughs> but hopefully that will help people if they're trying to find, what, do, what does it look like when I'm teaching this? How do I get there? Yes, I know the ministry is working on that, on case studies. There's one here about science. It is very surprising to me that in the new curriculum, ecology has been pushed to the primary grades and is virtually gone after grade five, with an increased focus on human biology, physics, and chemistry. Can you please comment on the rationale for reducing the studies of ecology and environmental studies at this time in history, when we need more than ever to have environmental leaders? Again, What's not there on the website is the elaborations. And in the elaborations, we start to see how those concepts are integrated throughout the different studies of science. So they are there. They're just not visible at the moment. Ecology and environmental science was considered important enough to actually dovetail it in multiple times. It's not just in one place. It's throughout the curriculum. And one place it's really going to show up, and you can't see it yet because it's not on the site, is in grade 9 where we see that uh, climate change and <coughs> matter cycling in that section there. Mm -hmm. I mean, definitely identified a couple of areas in terms of concerns, and it's been identified by members, and of course it's been identified in, in, you know, by us as a federation in our, our advocacy and lobbying with the ministry, and it's in the areas of uh, you know, necessary funding and resources, the support, the mentorship, and the in-service. And so, You've raised this as a concern, and you've been working on these committees, and I know there's uh, uh, ministry staff people on the committees, and so and maybe they're put in a difficult position because they, you know they work for the ministry, but has this issue been raised with the staff people that uh, you're working with in these curriculum revisions about the importance of this area to make sure that uh, you know for the curriculum and the revisions to be successful? It's got to be properly funded, resourced, in service for our teachers, et cetera. Over yep. mm -hmm. and over and over yeah. again. And the recognition's there. Mm -hmm. Politically hamstrung situation apparently is always there. So, yeah, I mean, I think the staff people are aware of it. And if they had the best possible world in which they could just open it up, they'd be highly supportive of doing everything. Whether that turns out to be the case is up to the political will of the. Uh, the, the government, I think. Absolutely. It was brought up and we basically what we were told to expect was that there wouldn't be money allocated right. specifically for then, this. But that hasn't stopped us from constantly pressuring for it. Absolutely. From here. And I think for number three when we're talking about advice, I don't know, Jim, if you're moving to that, but that's... I will be. Yeah. 
that's what I think that we, as PSAC, as, as PSA, and I think as BCTF and members, we've got to constantly, constantly remind and push that this has to be a thoughtful, gradual implementation, or you might as well just flush it down the toilet, to be blunt, because it's not going to fit, fix. It's going to be seen as a top-down, and we know how well top-down changes actually occur within the classroom. So it has to be done that way, and it has to be money and supported. And I wanted to make a comment on that also because it's really important for our members who are watching now who may watch later that, that the members that we've chosen to work on these committees on behalf of all the teachers across British Columbia know that you're also doing this advocating for what's going to be needed for the, in the proper mm -hmm. implementation. And, um, and, you know, and, and it's great, and, and like you say, it's just, it's just constant, and hopefully uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about it in uh, number three, but at some point in time we're hoping that uh, the government uh, will listen uh, because uh, there's a lot of work being put in uh, by yourselves and other members on the committee, and there's going to be a lot of work put in by our members in terms of... Uh, of uh, giving their own impressions and opinions uh, on the curriculum and then also when it gets implemented and so it's a, it's a critical uh, area and I know we're moving uh, in terms of time so I'm going to move to question three what should teachers and the BCTF do to work toward a positive result from the curriculum process in your area I think one of the most important things is to get involved and contribute suggestions as much as possible at the at this point the ministry seems open to input which is awfully nice and it would be great to continue that conversation and have it grow that said when we get this robust curriculum that is exciting and new and fresh and an entirely different way of looking at learning from what we're accustomed to we have to have it supported so when we see success people are going to say hey I want to see more of that what can we do to make it better and what's going to make it better is more mentorship and more support Sharing ideas about what works and what doesn't work would be really important for individual teachers. And I think it's important for people to be willing to get let things get a little bit messy in terms of stepping back, letting the students have a bit of control over their own learning. And as teachers, we feel a lot of responsibility, obviously, for the lessons we teach. We have that emotional investment. When we start to go into a model where students are taking more personal direction, the student is in the driver's seat, in a sense and the teacher steps back and is more of a learning coach or a facilitator as opposed to the expert giving the knowledge in the class. It's, it's a growth process and it takes a little bit longer than it would to normally just you know lecture on a topic and deliver what the teacher knows. Letting the students go through the process of their learning will end up with individuals in our society that have a deeper understanding of the world, but it does take a little longer and it does take a different mindset from the teacher. So being willing to try that new adventure in your classroom is important, I would say. I've already said what I've, I mean, the nail that I've been hitting constantly since the beginning of this whole process was the nature of how it was all going to unroll. And also development resources, I think, for the BCTF, I think we've gone a fair step into the, with, the, with respect to the learning portal. Um, for example, we're at some point the BCSSTA's Ning site, we're going to roll over into the learning portal and get a central closet, but it shouldn't just be up to us. I mean, it's one thing for BCTF to, to look at developing resources, but the ministry should also put its hand in and develop resources and for teachers to use. And even that being said, provide funding to districts and departments for myself as department head to be able to provide teachers and students with the resources they need and not have to rely on parent charity nights to do this and in different areas. I want my Van Tech kids to have the same access to the same quality materials as any kid has anywhere on the west side of Vancouver or anywhere so there's not an economic disparity between access to resources that I have. This, I have if we're going to go, if it can't also be online. I mean, there's some areas where it's, it's, it's almost a joke to depend on what's happening in terms of your feet. So we need to pressure um, boards and, and pressure ministry to make sure that kind of access for students to the materials are easily accessible, not just for teachers, but for students as well. And that's a process I see not quickly attained. It's something that's going to need time. And that's why I think that, that resources should be as gradually 
thoughtfully developed and vetted as, as uh, the implementation. And if you are going to implement, those resources, resources should be in place prior to the a, you know, whatever you want to call it, an actualized date of implementation. There's a question here about, has any thought gone into how we bring Aboriginal community members into our classrooms in a respectful and culturally appropriate way? One of the challenges we face with the inclusion of Aboriginal ways of knowing and being is a lack of cultural understanding within our schools. Well, there's definitely been thought put to it. Right. And again, the curriculum is open enough that teachers could go to elders in their own community and ask them, would you be willing to come to my classroom? What, and it's okay to say, what is a respectful way for us to do this and include you? How can we best do this? Please help us. Please show us. And depending on where you are, that might look different if you're on the West Coast versus whether you're in the interior mm -hmm. or up north. Place-based aspect. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And recognizing that and respecting it, honoring it. Um, and seeing it as living and vital. Absolutely. As, as Ken, my friend, said, I mean, you know, uh, not treating us like art, not treating Aboriginals as artifacts. Mm -hmm. They're not something, they're, they're a living embodiment of our community. They're, they're defining who we are. We define each other in our, in our interaction with each other. So mm -hmm. to live that, I mean, at uh, our school, there's, there's, there's got to be a seamless way in which there's not a separation, there's not a uh, segregation. It's something that's just part of our community. That it is a substantial complement complement of, of who we are in, in the classroom and as teachers and students. So. And how, how wonderful to have the space in the curriculum, to have community involvement to help shape that curriculum depending on where you are. The students can help develop that curriculum. Like you're saying, you know, you go into a course and, hey, let's, let's take a bit of space in this course. Here's a blank page. What are we going to do? What are we going to do to develop this? Getting a conversational approach to developing their own learning or asking community members to come in and help shape that. If we have um, one big issue, I think, you know, we have this, at the moment we have a conversation where the ministry appears to be supportive of this change, this transformation, which could be very positive. At the same time, we have lack of funding. And then we have also got sort of a specter behind us. What's going on with assessment? What's going on with regulation? We say we have freedom to shape the curriculum, but we have other things that are at play. So if we like what's going on with this curriculum, if we can make it vital, if we can make it work, the public will respond to that. Yeah, assessment may just pull the rug out of the entire thing. But there's also another aspect too. There's other cultural studies that are in, in place in the class. Like I can, last year I marked a Socialist 11 exam and it was a short response. I'm Chinese, this has nothing to do with me, it's all European guys, um, which was interesting response. Uh, so this, uh, at least with social studies, then the positive and the concerns I have is getting the materials. That if I have a class that's 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 95 percent mostly of Asian culture, then I can actually start thinking about designing some of what I'm doing with respect to that. So the Aboriginal cultures being all cultures I can bring into the classroom, I can fit what I do. I don't have the resources. I just, I mean, I have to struggle for them. That's the you know, you have to spend, it's like researching and trying to get them all together and putting the pieces together and it's to, that's the biggest difficulty in it. But at least now we can do that place-based yeah. lesson which incorporates, for example, the students of Chinese ancestry mm -hmm. as opposed to saying, you know, here's counterpoints, there's our course. Yeah. Which gives us a lot more freedom to uh, meet the needs of um, whatever communities we have depending on where we are, people of different ethnicities, people of um, different, uh, I would say, um, experiences in Canada. If you have a population of people who are new to the country who don't speak English very well, what you're going to be working with them on is going to be probably different than if you are, let's say, in a, a classroom that's predominantly students of European descent who's ancestors have been here for a couple of hundred years or maybe a classroom of students whose ancestors have been here for thousands of years and it should be different. There's a question about timeline for implementation and um, everything that we've heard it depends on the feedback received mm -hmm. 
and the ministry plans to review all the feedback by the end of the school year to analyze it all and report out on what they've heard. To date, they have between 500 and 600 individuals responding on the web-based questionnaire, so anyone that hasn't gone there should go there. The BCTF also has a discussion uh, curriculum discussion form that's accessed on the portal. And there's also a, um, the Ministry of Education has a Twitter hashtag, hashtag BCCorrect, that people can go to. And they can also go to the BCSSTA Twitter feed. There's a lot of specific social studies questions being raised and also our listserv as well. And my listserv is accessed through the BC tip. Yeah, you will contact your PSA. Yeah, con yeah. okay. So, um, it's uh, a couple things here too. Uh, I think it was you, Nancy, that you used the term, or was it Dale? You know, try encouraging teachers to try the new adventure in terms of aspects of it mm -hmm. uh, while it's happening. And I think what's also important in in, in trying the new adventure and, and the excitement about it is that the teachers know that they have to be supported. Absolutely. In in doing this new adventure with uh, with administration, especially if there aren't the, mm -hmm. all the resources there right now, and and so the ability to be able to to see what's working and what's not working, and then uh, you know make those recommendations on on what needs to be uh, changed in that aspect. So, so where are you both now in terms of? Um, the curriculum revisions and like in terms of is there more face-to-face -face meetings that you're going to be having more work or what, what's your role in on the committees now as we go forward my understanding is that our committee work for science at least has mostly been drawn up we still do have communication with the other members of our team from time to time mostly about uh, for example BC science teachers conference uh, that happened in October the catalyst conference we had a number of committee members who presented a workshop to communicate to teachers what some aspects of the new curriculum were. But in terms of the actual development, it's mostly done. We, we have some feedback that we're giving occasionally, maybe once every couple of months we might okay. get an email to give a bit of feedback on something. But essentially we're wrapped up. Ditto. Same thing. It's the same, yeah. It's, yeah. Just, it's essentially, it's, yeah, as Nancy described it. And so now it's but we're kind of But we're kind of waiting for the grad review. I mean, until well, that grad review process mm -hmm. comes up, everything's still kind of up in some kind of either. Yes, it's interesting. It's, it's been all this work on the K-9 to and then uh, the 10, 11, 12, is, which was out there first that they were going to be working on and then it's been held But the back funny thing is we have grade 10. It's, it's sitting there somewhere, but who, where it is and how it is shaped by in that black hole of the grad, grad review. Yes. The surprise I had at the ministry was the degree of compartmentalization in the ministry. Like, so and so doesn't speak to so and so, or they don't seem to know what's going back and forth. So it's interesting. So well, that, that at least we're not being told, maybe. But. And that will be an important piece. And I think uh, you identified the assessment will be another key part because mm -hmm. it could pull the rug out. Up God, if they put multiple choice into grade in, 10, that to would be what like, this is mm -hmm. trying to accomplish yeah. here. So. Um, so I think that we're almost out, out of time here, and so you know I want to thank you, Dale, and, and thank you, Nancy, for uh, for your committed time and your energy uh, in working on the uh, curriculum revision, and as well as all our other members that were involved in this, and, uh, and 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 the work that you did in influencing and where the direction it should go, and for being here and sharing your ideas with us and uh, it just was so cool to uh, you know to see your enthusiasm uh, for this work and where this can be going and what's so positive about it for the future but also recognizing uh, some of the realities of what we're going to need in terms of the system and the support and the resources uh, so that uh, the curriculum can move forward in a positive way and so our teachers uh, can be successful with uh, doing what's uh, needed to uh, bring this uh, piece alive with our students. So thank you for your work, uh, thank you for being here and I also want to thank all of those uh, out there who've been uh, uh, viewing and in our, our audience here and everyone who's uh, you know, taken the time to uh, ask uh, questions or send us their questions as well as uh, everyone who's uh, uh, been giving us feedback on the uh, developments and, and watching closely on what the uh, new curriculum is going to be like in, in British Columbia and uh, when it actually happens. And so we invite you to continue this discussion by going to uh, the discussion forums on their 
on, on the portal, and you can also be taking a look at the uh, curriculum drafts, and you can get to see the, uh, what the websites are when you come to our website where you need to uh, go. And so uh, I think this has been a, a really great uh, first uh, one for us in, in this area, and uh, we've got some more uh, professional issue seminars over the next few weeks, and they're going to be uh, advertised on our website, and I know we uh, look forward to it. So again, Nancy, Dale, thank you for thank all you. the thank work, you. and thank you for all the work that you do on, on our behalf and on behalf of students and for public education. It's, uh, it's appreciated. So take care.